Hi, my name is Audrey Emran Beardsley. I'm an associate professor at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State University. We have a show that we developed titled Inside the Academy, during which we interview some of the top scholars in our field. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Howard Gardner. Hi, it's a pleasure to honor you today. Hi, thank you. Tell us about your childhood and growing up. I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I had a, I would say, a pretty uneventful childhood. That may also mean that I repressed it. <laughs> um, I was a studious kid. I'm also a serious young pianist. And uh, I always had a small group of friends, but they were good friends. So um, I've often said that I kind of lived in my own mind. And I came to that conclusion in part because now there's lots of talk about bullying. And I asked myself, did I get bullied when I was young? And the answer was I may have, but if I did, I didn't notice it. Um, and so it, 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 the, the childhood was, was uneventful in, in that sense. On the other hand, um, my family was very important to me, and my family had a very traumatic background. Mm -hmm. My parents grew up in Weimar, Germany, and they were comfortable and uh, thought that they would sort of live off the business. Uh, um, my mother, uh, when she came to America at the age of 28, had never cooked a meal or made a bed because um, her, you know, her creature comforts were taken care of by the, the people who worked for the family. But then, of course, there was the rise of Hitler. My family was Jewish. My parents were quite prescient. They moved in 1934, the year after Hitler came to power to Italy to escape Hitler. Mm -hmm. But then there was the Hitler Mussolini Pact, sure. and they realized that uh, the Jews were not going to be very welcome in Italy either. So they had a child and moved back to Germany. And then my mother and uh, Eric, their child, were kept hostages in Germany when my father went back and forth to the United States trying to find somebody who would sign an affidavit so they could leave the United States. And that took uh, three years. Um, and they actually arrived in the United States by boat on Kristallnacht, the night of the shattering glass, when many of their relatives were hounded, some of them died, and so on. So they got here in the nick of time with my brother Eric. Um, that was 1938. In January of 1943, my brother Eric died in a freak accident, a sleigh riding accident, with mm. my mother watching. And she was pregnant with me. Mm. And many, many years later, my parents said to me, if they had, my mother hadn't been pregnant with me, they would have killed themselves. Now, we have no idea of knowing whether that was true, but if you think about it, you know, if you're comfortable, you don't have a worry in the world, then you have to leave your country. They were allowed to take, I think, $5 out of Germany, um, but they were allowed to take out possessions if they paid four times the value. My mother is 101. She's still alive as we speak in March 2013. Her furniture is stuff which they took out from Nazi Germany uh, mm. you know, 70, uh, 74 years ago, 75 years ago. Anyway, my parents did not talk about the Holocaust. They did not talk about my brother. In fact, I only discovered that he had died um, by finding some old clippings. Mm. But there's no question that the, the atmosphere in the home was colored by this history, which I only gradually became aware of. And whether my parents were right in shielding me from this or wrong is, is moot at this point. There were very different child-rearing practices at that time. We're talking 70 years ago. You didn't talk about stuff to kids. Mm. Now we probably err on the other side. You know, even <laughs> you know, we, we tell our, our kids what, what sexual positions we have, even if they, ha <laughs> they haven't asked. Um, but we might say it was kind of repressed uh, uh, atmosphere. The other thing I would say is that uh, uh, I was a serious pianist and when I turned 12, my teacher, who was very good, he was 95 years of age, he'd actually studied with Edward McDowell and Clara Schumann, things which I didn't believe because how could anybody living in 1950 in Scranton have studied with people in the 19th century, people who were household words and music. But of course, if you're 95 years old and were born during the Civil War, you could have done that. He said, well now, Howard, you have to get serious. You got to practice three hours a day and start taking lessons in New York. And I said, forget it. Um, I'm not interested in doing that. I think it was a wise, but it was a wise decision, but it was a snap decision. Um, I think if I'd lived in New York and I had parents who weren't immigrants, 
I would not have been given a choice really about whether I continued music lessons or not. So um, I stopped formal lessons. I continued to play, and both in high school and college, I um, taught piano just for fun and to make a little extra money. Um, my, I was a very good student, and when I was 13, my parents took me to Hoboken, New Jersey, to Stevens Institute of Technology, um, to have me tested, unquote, a word I'd never mm -hmm. heard at that time. And I took a whole bank of tests, five days, I think it cost $300, which was a huge amount of money. It was probably you know, three to $10,000 in buying power. And at the end of that period, um, we, we got called in, Mr. and Mrs. Gardner and Howard, they said, your, your son's quite bright, he could probably do anything. But um, he's the most talented in clerical work. And by clerical work, they didn't mean wearing a collar, they meant you know, figuring out all the B's in a line or something. And at some unconscious level, I said to myself, if we had a schlep to Hoboken for five days to be told I could be a clerk, this is really a waste of money. And that probably had something to do with my ultimate skepticism about, uh, about what you can learn from, from formal testing. Mm -hmm. um, realizing that you know, they had a, a bright kid on their hands um, and that the schools in Pennsylvania were not very good. In fact, um, they wanted to send me to Andover, which is a very, very good uh, private school. But I didn't want to leave home, so we compromised in a local uh, independent school called Wyoming Seminary, and I went there um, as a five-day boarder, boarder for, um, for three years. And I was stretched in Wyoming Seminary more than I would have been in Scranton, but I was really never stretched till I got to college in 1961 to Harvard College. And that was the first time where, to put it a little bit uh, grandiosely, I didn't have to hide what I could do and what I knew. Um, I also walked through the Union and heard people play Rachmaninoff's Third Piano Concerto practicing, and I said, you know, this is a different league than the one I knew in Scranton or at Wyoming Seminary. So that was a, a you know, kind of a, the way I put it now is, for the first 18 years of my life, I was a big fish in a very little pond mm -hmm. in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and that had many good features. I never really worried about whether I was accomplished because compared to other people, I was accomplished. But if I'd grown up in New York, um, or had gone to Phillips Academy, I would right away have seen that you know I was good in some things, but certainly there were many people who were better in other things. I would have had a different different self image. So that's that's my childhood in seven minutes. <laughs> okay. And how did those experiences in your childhood, as well as in school, inspire the scholar that you ultimately became? I didn't even really know what the life of a scholar meant. Mm. My parents had never been to had never had higher education themselves, and indeed. In the whole extended family, which was now 50 people who had escaped from Germany and living in New York or Pennsylvania, I was the first to go to college. So in a sense, I was breaking new ground. And in a way that I wouldn't say was oppressive, I had a sense that everybody's eyes were on me. But in those days, uh, if you were a, a bright Jewish boy, the only question was whether you would become a doctor or a lawyer. And there were no other options. I'd never heard the term scholar. Um, I, I didn't know. And I'm, I'm, not being, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. I assumed when I went to Harvard College and read a book by somebody, that person was dead. Mm. I didn't realize there were still people alive who could write books. I was very naive. I also thought that movies were all about actors. I wasn't even aware that such a thing as a director. Mm. And worst of all, or funniest of all, um, when I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, there were movies where they made fun of Scranton. And I assumed that in every city, they would dub in the name of that city, you know, Newark, Hoboken, and so on. But when I went to college and went to movies, they were still making fun of Scranton. So I was really very, very parochial. But um, when I went to college, I immediately liked studying. I liked taking courses. I probably audited more courses than anybody in the history of Harvard. I mean, dozens and dozens of courses. I went, and not just to the first lecture. Of course, I didn't like the course. I stopped going, but I actually stayed through the lecture, and I got a very broad education. And what I did, I tested myself. I took the pre-law courses and the pre-med courses to show myself and my parents, if they were interested, I could do that if I wanted. In fact, I remember the other day going out to Stanford after my junior year in college um, and going to talk to the medical school admissions there. So I was quite serious, could I get into Stanford Medical School? And I took a course at Harvard with Paul Freund, the great constitutional scholar. And he called me and he said, you really should think about becoming a lawyer. So I was testing myself 
But by the time I became a senior in college, I realized I really wanted to go on in psychology. Initially, I thought I would go on clinical psychology because I didn't really want to go to medical school. And if you're interested in the field of psychology, um, going to medical school is a pretty big detour, you know, internship, residency, and so on. But, and I was actually going to do a residency in the summer after my senior year in college at a um, mental health place in Pennsylvania. And then by a series of really odd coincidences, one after another, um, I heard about Professor Jerome Bruner, mm -hmm. who was then 50 years of age, mm -hmm. and he was a psychologist, very well known, but at most I would have just heard his name, that he was doing some educational work in the Cambridge area, where I, I was going to, where I was at the time, and he was looking for people to help him develop a curriculum in social studies um, for kids who were in fifth and sixth grade. And for some reason, I thought that sounded interesting. So I took a chance. I went to see him, and he talked to me for five minutes and said, you're hired. Um, and then I wrote to the clinic where I was going to work, and they wrote me a very angry letter. And I, I think I, 50 years later, I could have written the same letter, say, you know, we gave you a position. We promised you funds. Why are you doing this? And I did my best. I wrote back an apologetic letter. And the other thing, which is of autobiographical interest, is when I was in high school, I dated a lot. But in college, I didn't really date very much, and that's because I was really involved in, in scholarship and in my male friends. You know, I, I went out sometimes, so it wasn't important. But once I finished college, I kind of turned my thoughts elsewhere. And I remember very vividly um, Professor Bruner, we, I think I was already, everybody called him Jerry, said, well, next week, Judy Krieger from Berkeley is going to come and start working on this project. And I said, oh, a young woman is coming. And uh, she actually showed up, I think, about July 8th of 1965, and she was becoming a doctoral student of his. And uh, we fell in love and, in fact, wanted to get married right away. And our parents, having cooler heads, said, no, you should wait a while. So we, we waited a while. So Bruner was an incredibly important influence in my life. I mean, I've been incredibly lucky, and I've written extensively about this, that I've had so many wonderful mentors and very few tormentors, though if you ask me, I'll, I'll tell you about a, a tormentor. Um, but nobody had more influence on me than Jerry Bruner, both because he switched me from being interested in clinical psychology to being interested in cognitive and developmental psychology, which is where I got my degree, and Judy Krieger, then Judy Gardner, became also a cognitive developmental psychologist. And the way that Bruner ran his enterprise. We were working in a school in Newton, Massachusetts called the Underwood School, um, where I eventually taught. You can ask me about that later if you want. Um, and every day we would develop curricular materials in the social sciences for fifth and sixth grader. The course was called Man, a Course of Study. It was enormously influence, influential 40, 50 years ago. And then we would try the curriculum out, and then we would revise it in the afternoon and try it again the next day. So it was really, nowadays you would see it as very entrepreneurial. And at lunch, Bruner would bring in delicatessens from a delicatessen in Cambridge, and everybody would sit together and eat delicatessen food, which I love, you know, different kinds of cheeses and meats on bagels and on, uh, you know, different kinds of bread and, you know, drink uh, uh, different kinds of Dr. Brown and Dr. Pepper soda, and the notion that learning and working with colleagues and having eminent professors together with people just out of college and didn't sure. know, that, that made an enormous effect on me. And uh, a few years later, I was a founding member of Project Zero. I've been with that organization, which is part of Harvard for 46 years, and I've always tried to maintain that Brunerian kind of influence. And I'm very glad that uh, my teacher, Jerry Bruner, still very active in his late 90s as part of your series, because he really has had such enormous influence in psychology, education, literature, and so on. What did you decide to study for your dissertation at Harvard? Let me, let me say a bit about my graduate years, because I think it might be helpful to students okay. who watch this. Sure. I love being an undergraduate, and I worked with Eric Erickson, with David Reisman, with really eminent scholars, and I had no hesitation about talking with them and working with them and so on. Um, I hated graduate school when I started. This was 1966, 67. And that's because it was very, we would use another word, transactional. You had to pick up a certain number of credits. You were being prepared to be mm -hmm. professional. And I just liked the idea of reading and exploring and so on. So I didn't like it at all. In fact, I was thinking seriously of quitting after a few months. 
Um, and I made a list of all the things that I liked and all the things I didn't like. And then I had an aha experience, which was graduate school should be for me. And I shouldn't care what it is that the, my, my fellow students want out of it. And I shouldn't care about what the professors want other than that I have to pass. But I should really use it for a way that's helpful to me. And I don't mean in a narcissistic way, but to getting the skills and knowledge that I wanted. And when I framed it in that way, it was a much mm. different experience. Yet, um, when I took my oral exams after my sophomore year, a very famous professor who I won't name wanted to flunk me because I wasn't playing by the rules. And I was kind of defended and protected by some other professors, and that's made an enormous uh. impression on me about how you, know, you can be attacked by somebody, but if good people, people who are respected, protect you, that gives you some um, protection. When I was in graduate school, I was already working on three books. In fact, I published a book during graduate school. And even those days, it was not particularly held to your credit to write books in graduate school. You're supposed mm -hmm. to do articles with experiments and not write books. Um, but um, I decided with a wonderful advisor, um, Roger Brown, that I was going to do a thesis fairly quickly. And I was going to, the thesis was not going to be a long, torn out, you know, 100 page document. It was going to be three publishable articles. This was the very first time when you could do a thesis not just as one monograph, mm -hmm. but as a th three articles. And I did that. And the articles were on a very arcane subject, style perception in young children. Um, I was already interested in the visual arts. After I finished, in all the arts, I mean, I've already mentioned music. After I finished college, I spent a year in London, supposedly enrolled in London School of Economics, but I have to admit I was rarely seen there. But I loved going to theater and plays, and uh, I actually wrote a novel. It was terrible, uh, <laughs> concerts and so on. And I recognized as a developmental psychologist in the Piaget Bruner tradition that almost everybody thought being cognitive development, being cognitively development, being a scientist. And I said, well, artists have minds too. They do things. I'd been a serious musician. So I decided I was interested in artistic development. And one of the books that I was working on was a book called The Arts and Human Development, in which I took the end state of the artist as being every bit as plausible for what we're developing toward cognitively as being a scientist or mathematician or, or whatever. So um, one of the things that interested me was how people who know something about the arts can take a look at a work, let's say the visual arts, and come instantly say, oh, that's a Monet, or that's a Renoir, or that's a Picasso. And I, being very musical, if you turn on the radio, um, I can tell you who the composer is almost instantly. And if you don't know, I'll tell you the secret. If in doubt, it's by Schubert. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven all wrote in the same general classical thing. But Schubert died younger, so his style wasn't quite as individual. So if it's great, but you don't know who it is, it's Schubert. Schubert. So I became interested, how can people make judgments so fast? Now, what's interesting about paintings is if you're a kid, the first thing you see is, is it a painting of a horse? Is it a painting of a woman? Is it a painting of the ocean? Or is it a, an abstract painting? Um, so if you show people all paintings of horses, or all paintings of seas, or all abstract paintings, there's no subject matter there. So then the question is, can they perceive the style? Mm. And so I became interested in what style was. I studied it philosophically. By that time, I was working with Nelson Goodman, who had almost as much influence on me as Bruner. Goodman was a philosopher. Bruner was a psychologist. And I was very interested in what style was. So anyway, to cut to the chase, I wrote a thesis on style perception in the visual arts. And subsequently, I looked at style perception in other art forms. And in fact, I met and fell in love with Ellen Winner, who became my wife many years later, um, in our joint studies of, of literary, uh, uh, of st students' understanding of metaphor, narrative, other things. So um, if you talk to me in 1970s and I was being pretentious, um, which I'm capable of being, <laughs> though it's not something I want to be, I would have said, well, Piaget took science as the instant development my colleagues and I, because by then I had a little research group, we're using, we're looking at the arts as the end state of development. And in the 1970s at Project Zero, we studied children's literary development, their musical development, their artistic development, and basically asked the same kind of questions about kids and the arts that, that uh, Piaget and Bruner and others were asking about kids in the sciences. 
The other thing in my graduate life, which was extraordinarily important, working in Project Zero with Nelson Goodman in a very intellectual atmosphere, we invited knowledgeable scholars to come and talk to us. And in 1969, and this is another one of these things I remember, <laughs> this is a joke, more vividly than my whole childhood, um, because my whole childhood I don't have a lot of vivid memories, never been psychoanalyzed. Um, <laughs> we invited a neurologist named Norman Geshwind. Norman Geshwind was a brilliant neurologist. Um, he died in 1984, very prematurely, very unnecessarily. But anybody who studied with Geshwind, we're now talking 30 years later, never forgot it because he was such a brilliant mind and a brilliant lecturer. I could hear him give the same lectures every year. He came to Project Zero to give a seminar. It started at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was supposed to go for an hour or two. It went till 10 o'clock at night. Mm. And it was talking about what we can learn about the human mind by studying brain damage, by studying people who've had strokes or tumors or trauma or some other kind of, of uh, um, brain disease and looking at how the brain breaks down under conditions of cortical insult. I had never thought much about studying the brain because in those days psychologists weren't interested in the brain. I'd sat in on one physiological psychology course, which was more than many of my colleagues did, but those days the notion of psychology was it was a black box. You didn't look inside the brain. But when I heard Geshwin speak and he talked about artists who had strokes and lost one ability and not others, or musicians who lost one ability and not others, I said, that's it. I'm trying to figure out how artistry works. Um, there are a limited number of things you can do with artists when they're intact, but if they have the misfortune to have a stroke, you can see how their abilities are organized. So then and there, I decided I wanted to do postdoctoral work with Norman Geshwin. I eventually got three years of support to do that from 1971 to 74, and I actually spent 20 years working um, in a brain damage unit at a local hospital studying patients who had various kinds of brain pathology. And so, to get a bit ahead of the story, f roughly from the late 60s till 1990, my research life was um, bivocal or bicameral. Mm -hmm. I would spend the morning working with brain damage patients trying to see what sorts of things they could and couldn't do as a result of cortical insult. Then I would go to Project Zero in the afternoon and we would work with kids trying to understand their development um, in various spheres, not just artistic spheres, but other ones. And um, it was the, the combination, the concatenation of working with kids and brain damaged patients and looking at artistic and other kinds of symbol using skills, which eventually led to multiple intelligences and to my general philosophy of research in the social sciences and particularly in the psychological sciences. And that is, there's no uniquely privileged way to understand the human mind. You can't understand the human mind just by looking at the brain or just looking at brain damage or just looking at normal people or just looking at gifted people or just looking at the bongo bongo or just looking at kids who live in the Upper East Side of New York. The best thing is to look at kids through many different lenses or look at any of us through many different lenses. So I've always been very pluralistic, very fox-like rather than hedge-like, hedgehog-like mm. in thinking that we will understand human beings, human nature, the mind best by using lots of different lenses. And that's always what I've done. And uh, when I wrote about multiple intelligences, I think what struck people was um, that I looked at more different populations, so to speak, than anybody had before. I wasn't just looking at normal kids. I wasn't just looking at prodigies. I wasn't just looking at autistic kids or savants. I wasn't just looking in American society. I was looking at other societies in the world. I wasn't afraid of looking in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't afraid of looking at test scores and their correlations. And that pluralistic, interdisciplinary thing has been very important to me. And to jump way ahead, what's very interesting about our time, we're sitting in 2013, is almost all the problems we look at are interdisciplinary problems. Mm -hmm. And yet, almost all the training is hyperdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And that is just a huge disjunct. And I've always been most attracted to people like Jerry Bruner, who also f think that we learn more if we look at people through many different lenses. And if you ask, is Bruner a natural scientist, a social scientist, a humanist, an artist? You can't answer that question because he looks through all those lenses. Sure. Tell us about your first academic position. Well, I had a very unusual academic career. Um, First of all, when I was a doctoral student, I was a tutor, which means I 
um, was connected with one of the houses at Harvard, and I had undergraduates who I worked with, and I loved doing that. And then, either when I was in graduate school or right afterwards, I taught a course at Clark University, which is um, fairly close to Boston, mm -hmm. and became famous because Freud went there in 1909, only time he came to America and gave famous lectures there. So and Clark has always been a school with a strong psychological orientation. But then from 1971 to 1986, I did not have a regular teaching job. I lived off of grants. In retrospect, I say, how could I possibly not have had a job and had to live from one grant exception to rejection to the other? But one of the nice things about being young is you don't ask those questions with quite the degree of, so, you know, I applied for a grant and if I didn't get one and I applied for another one. And I was very lucky in, in 1981, I got a MacArthur um, fellowship, which basically gave me support for five years. And th th by that time, I was in my late 30s. And I said both to myself and publicly, I got this gift from heaven, but after that gift, I think I should have a real job. Uh, and I'd been at Harvard, and I'd been trained in the psychology wing, but I'd been at the education school because that's where Project Zero was uh, uh, housed. And so, of course, I thought, well, you know, it'd be nice to have a job at Harvard, but that's hardly something you can ask for. Yeah. Um, and so I began to look at other places as well. And then um, a good colleague said to me, you know, Howard, you really haven't taught. You ought to teach a few courses at Harvard just so people show that you can put on your socks and your shoes. So I taught a few courses and they were well received and that helped me. Nonetheless, when I was put up initially for tenure, um, I didn't get it. They chose some other okay. people. And you know, it was a healthy thing for me. I, I got over it, but I had a wonderful dean. Uh, we were very, very close. Uh, in fact, I spoke with her this morning <laughs> on the phone. She's not the dean anymore. She's gone on to greater things. And she thought I ought to be on the faculty, and sometimes deans have that power. And my own uh, professor, Roger Brown, whom I loved and who I mentioned earlier, said to me many years before I became a professor, he said, Howard, you're going to have to be a chimney appointment. And I said, what's a chimney appointment? And he said, from the top down, meaning, and again, I think this is helpful for younger people who might be watching this. Um, sometimes uh, the people who usually make judgments about who would fit in the position don't have the same perspective as someone who's looking out for the wider institution. And I think there were people at Harvard who um, realized that I would be useful for the institution, even if the three professors who were in charge of the decision about who gets recommended at my school, rather like the, the grumpy one who said I should be kicked out of graduate school, <laughs> don't, ha don't, have, uh, don't have as much power. Also, the, the, uh, um, and I think I can say this, and it's interesting for the record, um, the School of Education didn't have tenure from early 70s, no, from the middle 70s until the middle 80s. And so one reason I didn't apply for a job is I said, well, why should I have to work for a living um, teaching if I can raise my own salary and do research. So I was kind of loath. And then, um, for reasons which are of historical interest, the Ed School reinstated tenure just about the time um, that, um, that I did apply for a job. And um, in order to get tenure at a selective place like Harvard, you have to go through a number of hoops. And in the end, there's a presidential group that meets, and they have to decide whether or not to give you tenure. And um, my dean, being very shrewd, invited from the outside Lee Shulman and Jerry Bruner to be outside examiner. Mm. Now, Jerry Bruner knew me very well. Lee Shulman did not know me very well. But she knew that they respected my work and that they, the, the president, Derek Bach, would listen to them. Nelson Goodman was one of the in-house witnesses, they call it. So he was from within Harvard. And this story was told to me afterwards. Um, Derek Bach, the president who sits like a judge, and his father was a judge, and s said to Nelson, um, I understand that Howard doesn't suffer fools gladly. And Nelson looked at him and said, uh, Derek, I wasn't aware that that was a job description uh, requirement for a Harvard professor. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a, s a snarly thing to say, but it sort of broke the ice. Anyway, I got through. And one of the things I've tried to do since in the you know, the, the essentially 30 years that I've been a professor, is to make sure that hyperdisciplinarism 
and hyper counting number of peer reviewed articles isn't the only lens through which we make decisions. Because I think that uh, often there are people who can be very valuable to a university even if they don't fit exactly into the, you know, the square hole that uh, people may think that they should fit into.